Hi, I'm Adam Porter and this is my board gaming vlog and today I'm going to talk a little bit more about game design. I mentioned in my last video that I wanted to put a bit more of a focus on game design since that's where uh, a great deal of my own focus is. I play a lot of prototypes of my own and other people's. I'm still keeping up with the modern board games but, but much more of an emphasis on design than just playing. So that's what I wanted to talk about. Um, I actually have two of my own games which have now been officially announced by the publishers which means I can finally talk about them uh, sort of openly online and this sort of thing which is which is great. So uh, the first one is, uh, well my, my prototype version was called Make It Snappy and it looked like this. Okay, a little, little box and it's, it's just a deck of cards really with a few tokens. This game has been picked up by Blue Orange and will be released hopefully later this month. And it's now called Big Bazaar, and uh, it's uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go into more detail about it in a future video maybe and talk about how I developed that. But it's great to be working with Blue Orange because, uh, I mean, Blue Orange is a fantastic company and they make beautiful, beautiful products like uh, Go Go Gelato and um, I, don't know, I don't know if you can see on the screen here, but uh, uh, things like Dr. Eureka and um, Baobab and they were originally, they were the original makers of Dobble or Spot It and the American version. But most recently, uh, they've actually won the Spiel des Jahres this year for the game King Domino. So uh, it's great to be working with the Spiel des Jahres winners. Uh, that, that's, it, it's nice to know that I'm with such a, a highly sort of uh, rated company. Now, added to that, uh, the winner of the Kinderspiel des Jahres award was uh, Brain Games for the game Ice Cool. Uh, and the Kinderspiel is the Children's Award, the Children's Game of the Year Award. Now, my other game that's also coming out at Essen is the game Doodle Rush, which is with Brain Games, so uh, the makers of Ice Cool. So not only have I got a game coming out with the Spiel des Jahres winners, I've also got one coming out with the Kinderspiel des Jahres winners. That's an amazing feeling, knowing that these are, these are such great companies to be working with. That game, my prototype here, was called uh, Inky Squid, but the new game is Doodle Rush, uh, and it's a sort of drawing party game. Again, I'll talk about it in a future video in a bit more detail. Um, but the main focus of what I wanted to talk about today was how do you get your games to market? And more specifically, how do you make money from your games? Uh, this is because I attend a regular weekly uh, game design meetup and people come to this group and most frequently they come along and they say, look, I've got this board game idea, I've knocked together a prototype, how do I make it better? How do I make the game work? How do I make it fun? And then we get more often than you'd think, somebody will come along and say, I've made a prototype, how do I sell it? How do I make a million from it? Now it's easy to dismiss that as, um, well, forget it, you know, you can't make any money from board games. But it's not actually true, not in recent years as more and more, th you know, many tens of thousands of, of, of copies of some of these games will have been sold. And those publishers, those, those designers will be taking a cut of those sales and will be making a decent amount of money. In some extreme cases, they, they, they'll be making potentially millions um, if, if the sales of the game are in the millions, which some of the top rated games are. So there is scope there to make quite a lot of money. Um, there's also scope to make very little money, and I suspect that is the truth for the vast majority of game designers, is that they're not going to make a huge amount. The other thing to say is, well, uh, if your game isn't good quality, then, you know, you're going to get nowhere. But that's evidently not true either, because there are many, many games that are quite doing commercially fairly well that aren't of a great quality. Now, I, I, I'm not just talking about things like Monopoly and... and um, uh, game of life and these sort of games that have been around for decades obviously they're financially viable because they're such a big brand and they're in so many shops that doesn't mean you're going to be able to go down that route and make your million that way but there are also a lot of toy companies a lot of book publishers and and, and makers of sort of gifts and things like that who are producing board games and those board games tend to go down that very um derivative sort of roll and move sort of route or party game route uh, and yet those games still come to market and they still sell very well. So I can't say that a uh, just because something is a poor design it's not financially viable. Uh, it's, it's a possibility that that sort of game could get to market and could do rather well, although I think you're going to have to be fairly imaginative in your ways of getting that to market. So what are our routes to market? 
Let's deal first with how do I make my game better. Just very briefly, I'll probably make a future video on that. And the answer is firstly, um, play test and secondly, research. So, so you're going to be playing lots of games. You're going to have played many, many of these games around me. You're going to know all sorts of different types of things that are happening in the modern gaming world. You're going to be talking about it a lot online and researching a lot, reading a lot, as well as playing these games. That's essential. And then your own prototype is going to be played tens or hundreds of times with different groups um, in, in all sorts of different ways. And we'll go into a lot more detail about that in future, um, future videos. The other thing is don't get defensive. People are going to criticise your game you need to put in the work to make it better. It is going to get criticised and, and it needs to be um, in order to make that design robust and, and be rigorous um, with your quality testing. That said, once the game is of a decent quality, in your eyes, and hopefully in your playtester's eyes, how do you get it to market? You have four different potential routes. The first route is self-publishing. This means that you're going to put in the money, you're going to put in the time and the effort. You're going to make, in your initial print run, probably 500 to 1,000 copies of that game, maybe more. Okay, that means handcrafting it or producing it through printers and things like this. A great deal of effort, time and money is going to go into that. You're then going to have to talk about this game everywhere, probably through social media in this sort of digital age. You're going to have to go to markets and start selling. You're going to have to be that sort of, you know, hit the ground running, selling out the back of a van. It's, it's that sort of Del Boy approach, okay? You publish your game and then you get it in front of people and you start selling, okay? That has almost gone by the wayside as a method, not entirely. If you have a good uh, degree of experience in marketing and branding and you're willing to set up a company along those sort of lines, I suspect you could do rather well. There's a company in the UK called Big Potato whose games are not the most original games in the world. Some of them are fairly derivative of older games, um, although I think they're, they're getting more imaginative with their games. But their branding is exceptionally good. Um, very modern, very now, very sort of social media sort of friendly. Um, there's a, a good sort of wit about it. Um, and and, and th th those games have crossed from, the, 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 they're in the mass market, uh, in, in the UK at least, uh, and I suspect elsewhere, but they're also popular with hobby gamers and you'll see them in the hobby gaming shop. So Big Potato has proven that self-publishing can still work given the funds and the experience. Your second route is crowdfunding. So this is like self-publishing but here you get the funds up front from the potential uh, purchasers of the game through a website like Kickstarter or Indiegogo and uh, only once you've got all the funds do you start producing your game. Now this is a very common route to market for board games. Um, it's a lot of work. Uh, a group of friends, local sort of friends, um, Gino and Bevan and Tony, Tinkerbot Games, made the game Ghostal recently. Um, so these guys, I know them quite well. I know how much work they've put into uh, publishing this game. When you go down that route, you cease to just be a game designer, you have to be a publisher first and foremost. You have to understand the distribution, the, the production of the artwork, the production of the components, the, the social media presence, the, the discussion with your different um, potential outlets and consumers. Um, so it's a hard working sort of route and of course you don't have the, the only way you know whether your game is any good or not is through the play test of feedback. You don't have that that nice sort of um, uh, reassurance of having put it in front of a publisher who's played many, many games and has lots of choice between different games and them saying, yes, your game is good enough. So there's a chance you're going to produce your game and then it's going to get panned. And you see this a lot um, with Kickstarters where they, they come out and everyone's excited and then they receive the game and it turns out that it wasn't actually terribly good. Uh, and maybe the playtesting hadn't been particularly thorough um, and so on and so forth. But if you know your game is good, if you've playtested it with enough people, got enough feedback uh, and you're rigorous enough with that stuff, and you've got that business mind, or you've got a group of people, like I mentioned, Gino and Tony and um, Bevan, there's a little group there. So if you're, you know, more the designer type, then somebody else may have those other skills. That can be a great success too. Will it make you a million? Uh, most probably not. Most probably you'll make very little money from it. But there are plenty of cases where people have made a lot of money. 
Um, and, you know, if you're savvy, maybe you could be one of those people. The next route is the imaginative route, let's say. So another local group, um, people who have come along to our game design group, uh, created a game called Cucumber Sandwich. Now this is a very simple card game, there's not a great deal to it. Um, it's a bit like Pooh the card game, something like that. But it is a game all about penises. There are just numerous pictures of cartoony pictures of penises. It's not particularly offensive, uh, assuming you're not offended by penises, in that all of them are quite sort of, they've got cute smiley faces, they're not doing anything particularly offensive. They're just sort of hanging about, fishing, robbing banks, doing all sorts of stuff. <laughs> It's a strange, strange game, okay? Now that does not have an obvious route to market. It went through the Kickstarter, it had a very successful Kickstarter, but that has not made those guys their millions. However, can, is that game financially viable? I would say absolutely yes. I think that is a product that could sell in the right marketplace. Is that marketplace uh, local board gaming shops? Probably not. Is it board gaming conventions? Probably not. Is it the hobby market, the modern board gaming market? Probably not. But what about the gift shop market? What about the joke shop, the sex shop? The, 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 what about all these sort of avenues that something like that could go down? With a little bit of imagination and entrepreneurial spirit, I think something like that could potentially be quite a big success. So there's another route. Okay, have you thought about whether your game could go into gift shops? Are you willing to wander around different town high streets and talk to the independent shops and see if they might buy a few copies, 10, 100, 1,000, you know? Have you tried that sort of route? That may be a way to get to market. Finally, number four is your traditional uh, publishing route. And this is where I have the most experience because it's the, type, the, the, the way that I've always approached it. Um, so how does that work? Well, basically, you need to get in front of publishers. It doesn't have to be face to face. You could do it online. You could do it via emails and things like this. But I think it's probably easier to sit down with the publisher at a convention and talk things through and show them your prototype face to face. Now, that means traveling um, within the UK. There is the UK Games Expo and there are opportunities there to sit in front of a publisher and they will meet with you. But there are not that many big publishers there. There's a lot of self-publishers and crowdfunding types there who aren't necessarily going to be interested in someone else's design. But that's changing. So we're seeing more and more publishers being present at the UK Games Expo who will look at your prototype. We have the London Toy Fair. Now that is a very different style of marketplace because you're, you, you have got lots of toys there uh, and toy companies. As I say, those people often have designers in-house, not necessarily game designers. Um, and they, they're not necessarily going to be interested in looking at your stuff. But at the London Toy Fair, there are publishers there who will talk to you. Um, it's, it's, it, it's just a bit slim pickings. Then there's the travelling further afield and really where you want to be is at Essen or at Gen Con or one of those American conventions where the publishers tend to be there in great numbers. I, or Nuremberg, Nuremberg Toy Fair um, is another possible route. Essen Spiel, if I go to Essen Spiel and I have been, uh, I'll be going for the fifth time this year. When I go to Essen Spiel I can usually manage about 25 meetings with different publishers over a four day period and those will be some of the bigger publishers in the industry outside of Hasbro and the UMass market like within the hobby board gaming industry I can get in front of a great many publishers. And then I sit down with them for 15 to 30 minutes, I show them my prototypes and the vast majority of the time they say yeah it's a nice idea and they're not interested. Some of them will take the prototype away and then a few months later will send me an email saying, yeah, we liked it, but we're not interested for various different reasons. And then every now and then one of them will write back and say, yes, we'd like to publish this game and they'll send me a contract. OK, if I sign that contract, if I choose to, then I may well get an advance payment. OK, I won't necessarily or you may get no advance payment at all um, or you may get up to, say, but, well, at most 500 euros, 1,000 euros, maybe 2,000 euros. That's the sort of range that I've seen in my experience so far. Does that mean that that company will publish your game? In my experience, no. <laughs> um, so uh, you, you assume that they will and they've paid a deal of money and certainly they're going to put a great deal of time into looking at your game and developing it. 
but things can still fall apart. I've had six games currently signed. Um, two of those have then, after, you know, further down the process, the, the publishers come back and said, actually, we've decided not to go ahead with the project. Despite there being a contract in place and this sort of thing, the contract only says that the publisher has the right to produce it. If they don't produce it over a certain period of time, the rights revert back to the designer. Um, which is why advances are nice to have, because at least then you've got something for your trouble um, and they've reserved it and they've paid you a fee in order to do so. So uh, that's that's how you how you get those sort of contracts. What do you make from that? Well, you're going to be making royalties. Um, royalties are likely to be between three to seven percent of wholesale. Maybe three is a little bit low. Uh, so that means the sort of production costs of the game. With if you halve that for basically looking at the retail cost of the game. So if you've got a game that's uh, a big box game, thirty to forty quid. 30 to 40 pounds in the UK, then the designer will probably get a cut of maybe up to about a pound per copy sold. If it's a smaller card game, it might be more like 10p, 10 to 10 to 50 pence, um, depending on the, the retail price of the game. So you're going to need to sell thousands and thousands of copies in order to make this your living. So the majority of designers are doing it part time while also holding down some other sort of job. However, if you keep on producing games year after year and those royalties keep coming in, and particularly if one of your games becomes a perennial bestseller over multiple years, then that could be a good, consistent income over multiple years. And that's where you can really start to make some money. Now, I'm nowhere near at that point. Obviously, I've hardly seen any money so far beyond a few advance payments for contracts that have been signed. So. What has that route to market looked like for me? Well, it hasn't been easy, okay? The first time I went to Essen was 2012. That was more of a sort of scouting, see what it was all about. Around that time, I started designing games. I'd been playing games for a couple of years, the modern board games. So I'd probably played around 300 modern board games at that point. So I was pretty well versed in this uh, world of board games. And I, I would say many, many designers that come to our design groups may have played 10, 20, 30 games. You know, they, they, they don't have that breadth of experience. That's where I say do your research, get out to gaming meetups and do that stuff. Two years later, so we're talking now 2014, I took two games to Essen. I pitched them to multiple publishers um, and I didn't, I got offered a contract, which I then turned down for various reasons. Um, and, and that was that. But I got lots of very good feedback and stuff to work on. The following year, I took five games. I had many more meetings and I got two contracts signed. Um, and so that's 2015. As of 2017, one of those games is about to come out. Uh, so that's taken two years to come to market. The other one is still probably a few months or maybe, you know, within the next year, hopefully. So we're talking two to three years between signing the contract and this game coming to market. The amount of work and money that is spent on producing those games, uh, traveling to different conventions, showing them off, play testing them. It's a long time before you start to see any financial reward or even the sort of satisfaction of seeing the artwork and those sort of things. But it comes eventually. Uh, the following year, I um, took another bunch of games. I got another, as I say, another four games signed. Um, and then after that, a couple of those games of several months afterwards were dropped. In the meantime, I'm constantly producing new games. This year, going to Essen, I have seven games to take and pitch. So I'll be having many, many meetings. That's going to be a very tiring few days and a lot of work. I mean, seven games. I need to produce multiple prototypes of each if I want to give out prototypes at the convention. So if I have four conventions of it, uh, four prototypes of each game, we're looking at approaching 30 prototypes that I need to produce. Um, and I've got a couple of months in which to do it. So that is a lot of work up front for potentially very little in the way of return. Um, add to that <laughs> little frustrations like uh, a lot of my games I produce are little party style games, very simple things based around a single idea. Um, recently I produced a game, I've spent months play testing it, I've shown it to a few publishers, I've produced a bunch of prototypes and then I see somebody else has released a game that's virtually identical just over the last few days. Um, which means that my game is entirely redundant. Now I could try and force it to market through um, 
of different routes because there's no copyright on game mechanisms and things like that. So, you know, as long as I don't use any of the same artwork or words, I mean, I, I didn't copy it off anybody. I just happened to have the same idea as somebody else. But do I really want people looking at it and saying that's a copy or do I want, I, I, I don't, you know, I want, I, I want to produce games because of the love of them and the artistry of them, not because, just because of money. Um, so that game has had to either be scrapped or entirely overhauled and made into something very different. And hopefully it'll spur some new ideas and inspiration. So there are frustrations inherent in this. And then there's the day that you see that artwork. It gets sent through to you from the publisher. And, uh, and, and the, the, that, that's hugely gratifying, seeing how beautiful uh, these games are when they produce them. Um, and, and that's where the satisfaction comes in. I hope that the paycheck will eventually be another another form of satisfaction when when it eventually arrives. But I'm certainly not banking on that. Um, the, the other thing is, when I started all of this, you know, what are we talking three or four years ago when I started designing? It was a hobby. It was fun. Just fun. You know, I could put in as many hours or as few hours as I wanted. At this point, it's starting to feel like it's part of my working life, and that means it comes with stresses. I have deadlines to meet. They're self-imposed deadlines, but if I don't have that sort of discipline in the way that I work, then there's no chance of me actually making this a, a genuinely sort of financially viable part of my working life. Um, so, so that whole thing changes. It's still fun designing. Um, that it's, it's a lot more fun than, than, than my other sort of professional jobs that I do. Um, but it comes with inherent stresses. So taking that publisher route, just sort of handing the game over, letting somebody else produce it. In some ways, it's the easy option um, compared to self-publishing or, or, or the, the amount of hours and, and, and hard graft that goes into kickstarting crowdfunding something. Um, but it's, it's still hard. It's still hard. And you have to be um, you have to be confident to sit in front of somebody and sell your game and take the criticism um take the knocks and um and and, and don't be defensive and, and use that stuff to improve your game because as soon as you go onto that back foot then i think uh, and, and and start to think well they're criticizing it and, and refuse to change then you're really going nowhere Anyway, I, I've, I've ranted on for quite a long time there, so I, uh, I hope some of that information is useful to you. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to follow up with some games that are more about the artistry of game design rather than the business side. But I wanted to address this today just because I've been asked that question several times. How do I make money from my games? And I've seen it online quite a bit. And I wanted to make the point that it's not easy. OK, it can be quite tough, but it's hugely rewarding when it happens. Right. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, please subscribe to my channel, Adam's Board Game Wales. Please follow me on Twitter, at Board Game Wales. And on Board Game Geek, I'm Adam78. And please buy my games.